Um, welcome everyone. Um, uh, my name is Emmy Bocage and I am the Research Development Manager at the Turing Institute. And I'm delighted today to give you a brief overview of the health data science funding landscape uh, today before handing over to uh, Emma and Jacqueline for their um, grant writing workshop. So what I want to talk about today, there we go. Um, first, I'll give a brief overview of why we would want to apply for funding, just to remind you. Uh, and uh, then I'll um, talk a little bit about the funding models that exist in the UK and who funds what before um, going over to talk a little bit about a research funding plan. So the, the idea is to give you lots of information in these slides that you can then go away and use to look at strategies and calls and things like that of different funders. And that can then inform you to uh, to, to, to come up with a plan. Um, right, so why do we apply for funding? Well, for two main aims. One is to develop your research profile. Uh, having successful funding applications demonstrates that you can independently apply for, own, manage uh, your own project. Um, it also, for those of you that are um, in, in universities uh, and, and non-research institutes, it also can uh, give you the opportunity to buy out time for your teaching uh, and focus on, on, on research um, and, and not so much admin and teaching. Uh, and then secondly, it gives an opportunity to, uh, to think about impact and to generate the impact that you want to generate uh, with your research, whether that be academic, so progressing your career, advancing theories, creating data sets or conceptual, uh, informing, informing theories, um, uh, instrumental can, can be another impact, um, for example, altering behavior or capacity building, building skills. So lots lots of reasons to uh, to apply for funding. Uh, generally in the UK, um, there are two different types of funding models in terms of like the, 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 the constitution of, 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 a, of, a, of a project. One is team-based. So that's a grant that um, has a principal investigator, a PI, and co-investigators and a whole team behind it, like research support. Um, uh, a research support team or technicians, um, a whole bunch of people who work on one project. So that's one way um, to carry out a research project and to get funding. The other way is through a fellowship. So those are awarded to individuals, um, generally either to progress their career for early career um, academics or um, to buy out their time. So um, in, in that case, it's sort of the, the, the award is to one individual. Um, then in terms of what the funder wants, broadly, there's two different types. Um, so you've got responsive mode, which is very much a bottom up uh, academic led, where um, it's a, a very broad call uh, that can be filled in by, by, by the academics and what they want to research. And then in contrast to that, there's a challenge led approach where the funder sets narrow or less narrow uh, priorities on what themes uh, they want the funding to go to, what themes or areas research and or, or things like that. Um, so who, who funds what? Um, broadly, there's four categories in the UK where we can apply for funding for. There's public bodies, there's learned societies, there's charities, and there's international funding we are now eligible for as well. Um, so in terms of the public bodies, um, those are generally funded through the government. For example, DSET, the Department of Science, Innovation and Te Technology, uh, funds the UK Research Councils and ARIA. And then the Department of Health and Social Care funds the National Institute of Health Research. Then there's the Learned Societies. They're sort of national bodies who uh, aim to inform national and international debate um, and, and they are typically focused on certain disciplines. For example, the Royal Society is very much focused on STEM, um, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. The British Academy is more focused on um, social sciences and humanities and the Royal Society of Medicine focuses on, on medical sciences. Um, then there's charities and that's a very 
they're very big groups, so I've only listed a few in there. Um, there's there's the Welcome, there's Cancer Research UK, there's a the British Heart Foundation and the Lever Hume Trust. Uh, there's there's many many others, and they're basically not for profit, and they tend to be calls like that tend to be tend to be challenge led because they're very much focused in the theme that their charity is 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 focused on. Uh, and then, as I was saying, there's a sort of international funding that is available to UK um, researchers, uh, including the European Commission funding. So that ranges from the European Research Council to the Marie Curie Sladowska actions to uh, Horizon Europe. Um, now, zooming in to a few of these funders. Um, I'll talk first about the public body. So there's UKRI, the UK uh, Research Council. It's an umbrella body and it, it includes the seven individual research councils. UKRI has got a five year strategy. You see it is um, nearly coming up <laughs> 2027. So, um, but because we, we don't have anything else to go on or focus on, on what, what the current strategy is, uh, it focuses on, and that's sort of woven through all the research councils. So that's basically the basis of what UKRI wants, wants to do and wants to achieve. So that's building a green future, building a secure and resilient world, creating opportunities for communities, creating health and tackle infections. And through those themes, also in all the calls, they also focus on, they have they have this focus on people and career development, places, ideas, innovation and, and, and impact. And that each of the research councils addresses that overarching strategy um, in their delivery plans. And they have individual calls. They, all the research councils have individual calls and they also work together on, on, on calls, interdisciplinary calls. So the research councils are very much discipline based. So arts and humanities is AHRC, social sciences is ESRC, biological sciences is BBSRC, engineering and physical sciences is EPSRC, medical sciences is MRC and natural sciences is um, NERC. And then there's Innovate UK for sort of um, innovations and in working with, with, with SMEs. Um, uh, and I won't talk too much about Research England or SDF uh, at the moment. Um, so in the type of goals that they have, they are um, they can be challenge led and they can be responsive. They can be fellow, there can be fellowships as well um, and new investigator awards and also um, funding for training. Um, so moving on to the NHR, so that's, um, the NHR is funded by the um, Dep Department of Health and Social Care, and they're very much interested in the innovation pathway. So going from early translational research to clinical to applied. Um, NHR as well, they have a strategic focus at the moment that ranges from COVID-19, uh, COVID-19 recovery and learnings to building capacity, uh, a strategy, uh, a strategic area that you all know, know, know well, I think, is uh, people with multiple long term conditions uh, and um, underserved uh, regions and communities and woven through all that again is EDI, career development and working um, with the life sciences industry or with industry. So that's sort of their strategy. They have a whole lot of funding programs. They have multiple calls a year. Um, their calls are researcher led, but also commissioned. They do, um, they fund research training. Um, and they also have these themed calls, which are set by the chief medical officer uh, every year. At the moment, they are focused on compound pressures. And uh, those um, proposals that address the themed call get, get prioritized. So there's themed calls and another research priority they have at the moment are these highlight notices, um, which uh, for now they are brain tumors, motor neuron disease and dementia. If you go on the NHR website, there is a whole lot of, of funding on there. And it's sometimes a little bit difficult to navigate. I find it sometimes difficult to navigate the, 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 the website. But one thing I would say is that the NHR has got really good sort of research support service. They are very keen to work with academics um, and researchers from the very um, first steps of designing a project. Um, 
So they have uh, research support services and the local clinical research networks. And I've always found the people who work there really um, keen to help both for identifying funding resources with the research design and with the one thing that is always very much dreaded when uh, you work with patients and NHS staff, which is the the, the, the budgets. Um, so I, I very much encourage you to, to to reach out if you want to to them if you um, if you're interested in in applying for NHR funding. Um, and there we go. Uh, then moving on to uh, charities, I want to focus on the welcome specifically because they are a major funder. They're one of the biggest funders in health. They have about a 37 billion pounds investment portfolio and want to spend about 16 um, uh, billion pounds on, uh, on, on research in the next 10 years. So they're a major player um, in health research. Um, having said that, at the very end, um, in, in, in the sort of opportunities section uh, slide that I've made, um, I've also added an overview of um, the UK health funders. There's been a recent report on UK health funders. So there's 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 more charity funders in there if, 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 if you want to explore that further. But going back to the welcome, um, so broadly, they have two um, different types of funding. There's the challenges, uh, the welcome challenges, which include impact awards, commissioned research, challenge-led funding. And they focus on three areas. One is mental health, one is climate and health, and one is infectious disease. And then apart from that, um, there is the research discovery research funding, which has three streams. So one is early career, another one is career development, and another one is discovery awards. And that's much broader than this challenge led. You, you can apply if you have if your research is related to the challenge areas, but it's much broader than that. So they're interested in everything related to health, ranging from fundamental processes that underpin biology all the way up to the social and ethical context of human health and disease. And again, I mean, I find the welcome um, the welcome team very, very open. If you're not sure whether your research fits within the remit, um, within their remit or not, it's all, they're, they're always very open to sort of um, discuss and, 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 and confirm whether that is a go or a, or, or a no-go. Um, Moving on to learned societies. So I think I mentioned it before, they're national bodies, not for profit. They tend to offer fellowships, but also projects to inform debate, ensuring uh, international and national engagement with the particular disciplines that they're, that they're focused on. Um, I've mentioned two specific examples here. So you've got the British Academy, which is focused on humanities and social sciences. And in their strategy, um, they're really focusing on sort of opening the academy. They're interested in funding and in, in working with government departments, in working with industry um, to place fellows who are um, working in social sciences and humanities to embed them within, with, within those environments. Um, uh, yeah, and the uh, British Academy also offers uh, early, early career um, fellowships. And then there's a Royal Society as well. Again, um, STEM subjects, uh, they're focused on uh, ranging from computer science to health and, and, and human sciences. Um, and they offer a range of um, very competitive uh, fellowships and, and, and projects. And also um, they fund um, secondments, the same sort of to embed um, researchers in STEM within government and, 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 and industry and things like that. So I've mentioned those two. What I also want to mention is that uh, you're often much more aware than your research officers are um, in the association of the associations and societies within your own subfield. And they often offer um, small grants uh, for pilot projects and, and, and things like that, which are a really good step to sort of go towards larger funding later on. So it's worth exploring that as well. Um, Moving on to the international funding, I'm focusing specific specifically on Horizon Europe at the on Europe at the moment because since uh, September 2023, we are now eligible again to apply for the different streams of funding that are within Horizon Europe, the EU's key RNI funding program. Hooray! Uh, <laughs> um, so they are very much focused on their mission areas. 
Um, there are five. One is climate change, cancer, environment, um, smart cities, and soil health and food. And the, the Horizon Europe is, again, if you go, uh, I've, I've, I've put the link in there to their Thunder portal. There are so many opportunities in there. Sometimes you get a little bit lost to try and see what, what there is. But largely, they're structured around three pillars. So one is excellent science not silence. Um, one is uh, global challenges and one is innovative Europe. Um, within excellent silence, uh, silence, within excellent science, they have um, the European Research Council um, um, and they have Marie Curie actions um, and uh, research infrastructure. And I think those are mainly of, in, of interest to, to, to this particular group. So in terms of research infrastructure, they fund very large projects on open science, but within those very large projects, there's often funding schemes included that are sort of slightly smaller and that people can apply for. For example, the Oscars, and uh, Emma will be able to talk a little bit more about that if, if that's of interest. I think their next call opens in November, 2023, no, 2024. Um, and yeah, so within Excellent Science, there's also um, postdoc fellowship opportunities like the Marie Curie, uh, Marie Slodowska Curie actions that includes um, fellowships to uh, enable mobility within Europe. So to go from one country to another, and that includes the UK um, or um, outside Europe. And that's called the Global Fellowship. So they that includes going outside of Europe for one or two years and then come back to your own institution to sort of embed your learning and your training. Um, ah, yes. So I've mentioned quite a lot of funders and quite a lot of uh, diff the, 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 who all have uh, different calls with different deadlines, with different terms of conditions um, and with a different focus. So one of the things that some of my colleagues did at the University of Kent uh, a while ago is to create a fellowship wheel uh, to sort of show, because a lot of the fellowships they have recurring deadlines, so they, they're once or twice a year. So it's helpful to sort of see that in sort of an annual cycle. Um, and you can uh, you can um, personalize this, add funders that you are more familiar with or remove funders that you're not interested in, or also add particular grants that are more team based in your fellowship wheel. But it gives you a focus to see what's coming up in the next year. Um, and I'll, we'll, we'll share these slides so you can click on the different links with the, the, the various calls. Um, so because this this. And hopefully that will also help to sort of inform your funding plan. So I wanted to end this presentation by quickly talking about the funding plan. because There's so much information around, so many different opportunities. It's sometimes difficult to see the the um, the, 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 the trees. How do you say the trees through the forest? Um, the forest through the trees. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, the French research organization, the CNRS, um, uh, every year, academics who want to uh, become a permanent researcher, they have to um, apply with a document outlining their plan, of what they want to do for the next 10 years. And uh, the deadline for this is always after the holidays and everybody complains about it. Oh, I have to submit it again. And and and, and, it, and it's a big task, but I think it's absolutely brilliant. Having a 10 year plan or a five year plan is great because you sort of start to think about what do I actually want to do? Not tomorrow, but what do I want to be as a researcher? What do I want to be known for? Um, and why do I want to be known for it? And and how, what are the specific research questions you can use to, to address that vision? And what are the steps you need to take in the long term to sort of achieve your research vision? And once you have that, you can then go more short term for example, use the, 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 the fellowship wheel and look at, you know, what, what is coming up next year? What are the new bids I want to submit? Um, which ones are, which projects are in motion, but I haven't quite finished them? What relationships, what networks do I need to sort of develop in order to, 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 to start new projects or, or to form new bids? Um, 
So it's definitely something I, I would recommend to sort of have a more strategic approach to, to, to funding. And I'm sure Jacqueline will be able to talk about that uh, in, 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 her, in her training, in her workshop late, later on as well. Um, so just quickly, a few opportunities. I find that the UKRI, the UK Research Council um, funding finder is actually quite good because they often use, they often post pre-announcements which is their funding opportunities, but they don't have a deadline yet. So we know that they are going to happen at some point. And that's really good to sort of get your ducks in a row to start thinking through that particular topic. It's got minimal information of what they're looking for. So it's something to start prepping applications for. Uh, then I've put a link to the EU funding portal as well. It's always good to look at the particular um, funders' websites as well, to look at the guidelines, um, subscribe to their um uh, to their newsletters to see what's coming up. And your research office is always, um, uh, can, can always help with those as well. And especially looking at the terms of conditions of grounds, which may or may not fit with, with sort of the internal uh, approval processes of your institution. Um, and then I've also put, as I mentioned before, I put the UK Health Research Analysis Report in there, which has got a whole lot of, 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 of funders in there. Um, uh, who are major and, and, and minor players in the health funding landscape. Um, one thing I also find very useful is the Gateway to Research, which is basically a repository of what has been funded by UKRI, uh, to who, where, um, and you can you can search via, um, via topic. So it's always good to see if you have an idea and you look, you can search through there what has been funded on that particular idea. Um, it can also help with networking. And then the Open Grants website is an initiative of uh, researchers who um, are, share their successful, but also unsuccessful. I've seen some unsuccessful um, proposals on there as well, just to see examples of, of proposals. Um, and I think that's it for me. I hope I stuck to time <laughs> and I didn't talk too quickly. Um, if there's any that questions. were perfect. Oh, great. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm very happy to answer any questions or follow-up questions, but um, I shall stop sharing my screen for now. I'll make sure that the slides get distributed so you can use them. And over to you, Emma. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much, Emmy. Um, I realised once you started speaking that I haven't even really welcomed you all or actually said who was speaking or anything. So I'm actually just going to do that now. So I apologise for not doing a proper introduction. Um, so I'll do I'll do that now and then I'll cut the video so this bit goes at the beginning because that's how modern technology works. Um, so welcome everybody. So um, we've already had our talk from Emmy, which was amazing. Um, and Emmy did introduce herself. Um, so I'm Emma Caroon. I'm a senior researcher at the Turing um, in the community management team. Um, and also run lots of different research projects. Um, we've also got our other trainer here, who is Jacqueline Aldridge, who will, when she starts talking, she will introduce herself. I will not try to do that. She is much better at it. Um, and um, I'm just going to show you the schedule that we're going to do today. Um, and then we'll come back and just have if there are any questions for Emmy before we move on to the second section. But I will just share my screen just to show you um, our schedule for today, um, although it is in our shared document as well um so um you should be able to can you see my screen does it look like it come up yeah um so um we've already had our introduction to the funding landscape from emmy in a, in a second we're going to um, just pause for um five minutes of questions or if there are any questions for emmy on the landscape um and then i'm just going to do probably not even 10 minutes five minutes just from a researcher's perspective like what it actually looks like for a researcher in their career to apply for funding. So what sorts of funding I've applied for, particularly how successful I've been, if not always successful, um, which is one of my points in there, definitely not always successful. Um, and then we will move on to our main um, section of our um, of our training, which is really a, a brilliant introduction to the whole of grant writing, um, which will be um, Jacqueline doing a presentation, but we will then have a break. And then the, the session, um, which is from 12 to one, will actually be um, 
a small presentation, but actually doing a bit of work on uh, looking at um, writing abstracts for uh, grant writing and doing a bit of editing and discussion about that. So that will be much more interactive in the last bit of the, um, the session. So I'm just going to stop sharing and just say, are there any questions for Emmy after that wonderful presentation? As Emmy said, all of the slides from today and the resources will be shared with you uh, via email afterwards. So you'll get to see all of that. Um, so if you want to ask a question, put your hand up or you can just shout out or you can put it in the chat if you want to ask a question in the chat. I'm going to pause. I don't mind there being silent. So. Well, you must have loads of questions. Come on. <laughs> okay. Oh, Angela. Well done. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you. I think I found it really useful. I'm I'm, I'm not a researcher, so I'm coming from a I'm I'm. Um, a project manager on one of the AI aim projects, um, but um, I don't know about the ten year plan. But <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I'll be supporting the PIs in terms of our next grant. So we're looking um, widely. So that's my kind of perspective. But yeah, no, I found it really useful and informative. I, I don't think there was anything that you missed. So thank you. Well, not that I know of anyway. <laughs> thank you. I'm that's a little bit fun. nervous about approaching. But you know, you're saying about contacting people, and they're very helpful. Um, you know, whether it's NHR or Welcome or whoever. Um, yes, that's that's the bit that slightly makes me nervous. But I guess once I've got something to to raise with them, I'll I'll feel you know I'll understand it more. But um, yeah, yeah. And I I always found leave him for example. They're always at the end of a phone call. They will. I I find them so so friendly. That I mean that's what they're there for. They want to yeah. fund good research and they want yeah. to make sure that what what you know what you apply for is is within the remit and you know you, you you don't put in effort for something that that won't be funded so they're there to help you really so definitely would would, would go for it thank you that's good it's really good to know thank you yeah they're actually really contactable by email as well i found like they're actually really responsive like emmy says so you can like if you're not sure like there are often sections in grants like that you're not sure you actually need to fill in like sometimes it's like international collaboration something or other or you know cer certain sections which are a bit of bit strange ones which might be new to that funding call so you can just like say this is what I'm trying to do do you think if I need to do this and they will give you quite clear clear guidance so yeah definitely don't be afraid of asking them it's not going to be like seen as a bad thing that you're asking questions or anything I actually would rather help you I think like Emma said yeah, I mean, as Emma said, some of those schemes are so complex and often yeah. not that logical. So your question <clears> might be a very good one and it might stump them. Yeah. And, but you need that answer back from them, because if you win the grant, you've then got a little email that says, actually, yeah. that's fine to apply for a laptop in this case or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, they can. They know that they know the rules of that particular grant scheme or grant schemes have different rules <laughs> there is no it seems to be there is even from the same funder it looks like they're running the same scheme again they're not they are all like bespoke schemes and actually that's one thing to think that you can't just like transfer a application from the last scheme into the new into the next round because often they've changed the rules um so it's you have to be like you do have to go through things like with someone like Emmy, who's an expert, who I work with Emmy on grant applications and people who are experts in doing this, other people to check in with at your institution. And everyone has people like in Emmy's role at their institution that they can check in with. And they're the people who do know more about like they will do the fight. They will go through everything with a fine tooth comb and, and kind of check everything to make sure you as a researcher or a project manager who does lots of input into these things. Um, actually is following the right you know is writing the right sections is doing the right thing so yeah any other thank questions you. oh thank you Angela question um, okay so just because of time I'm going to start the next section which is about my kind of journey career journey through grants and fellowships um 
which is a very uh, windy road, I have to say, uh, which I think is probably true of every researcher. So um, hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, Jacqueline, I can only see you. So can you see my screen? Yep. Excellent. OK, so um, as I said, I am a senior researcher at the Turing. I've had quite a varied and loopy kind of research career because I've not been a researcher the whole time in my kind of working life. So I thought I would show you the whole expanse of my academic career because I think this gives a really good view of where you start applying, actually applying for money to fund your own research career and then where you can kind of get to when you become much more senior in your career. So for me, my first application was actually to the AHRC, which was actually called the AHRB, I think at the time, they've even changed their name, um, in 2000, and actually I think it was 2000, because I started in 2001, when I wanted to do a master's at University College London. I was originally an archeologist, so I was applying to AHRC, um, and I was very lucky. And my this um, slide shows you on the top all the things I've been successful at getting, well, most of the things I think I've been successful at getting. And underneath the timeline are the things I still have in progress, so applications that I'm still waiting to hear about. At the bottom, everything that I've been rejected for, actually not everything, because I couldn't fit it all on there, I think. So most of the major things that I've had rejected, I would say, because there's probably a lot of other ones, smaller ones along the way. Actually, I know there's loads of smaller ones. So I started off 2001, master's, brilliant. I got my studentship. I was really lucky also to get a PhD studentship. That was amazing. That really supported me. But actually, one of the things I found when I was doing my PhD, I did a lot of field work as an archaeologist. And how was I going to pay for that? So actually, I had to start applying for small grants, actually. And I think at this stage, it gave me really good experience of actually, because I, I did have to fill in quite substantial applications just for field work grants. And these were actually maybe up to something like £5,000, something like that. So fairly small amounts of money a lot of money at the time for me because I was a student so this actually paid for me to do field work so I I did that through institutional because I was at the Institute of Archaeology UCL they have very good grants internally but also a bigger one which is the Winner Gren Foundation that was quite a large application they're an American based I think charity that funds a lot of research field work so I was very lucky to get a grant from them to cover my actual field work because the studentship basically just kept me alive and then I needed money to actually do my actual research. And I think that's something that sometimes people don't think about when they go to do a PhD and it's something quite practical that you need to travel a lot and need to go and do stuff that costs money. So you do need to look around for these grants and they are out there to help you do, do your PhD field work and things like that. Um, after I did, so if we go down to the bottom bit down here, so when I finished my PhD, I did actually apply for some uh, actual research projects with my supervisor. We were not successful at the time. We wrote two really large applications to AHRC and NERC as well, who are the main funders for archaeological sort of scientific research. And actually, I, at that time, I got a bit despondent about research and I actually went off and worked outside academia, which is my career break bit. So I actually worked as a teacher for a while because uh, I do like keeping to upskill myself is one of the things I like doing. So teaching is really good for that. So I went off into teaching, but I did want to come back into academia. So I actually in that time, after a few years, I thought, well, I can apply for postdoc fellowships. So I tried doing that. I applied for a welcome one, I applied through Royal Society. I think I also applied for British Academy and I was not successful. I did a lot of work on that, I actually took up a lot of my time and I was working full time as a teacher at the same time. So that was like a lot of work. Um, also trying to write papers from, from my PhD as well at the same time. So the burden of that is quite a lot actually. And I wasn't successful in any of that. Um, I also wasn't successful sort of later on. Actually, these ones, Daphne Jackson and Dorothy Hodgins, are returning to research um, uh, fund fellowships. And I wasn't successful getting of those, getting those. And I think actually those were probably a bit earlier. Um, but I definitely was came back into academia probably about 2016, 17, something like that properly. Um, and then since then, I've kind of been employed in research. So I've had a job that's kept me going. But I've wanted to do um, 
my own personal research because it's sometimes in your job you're not actually doing your own personal research it's kind of an add-on unfortunately it happens a lot for me because I want to do archaeological research so I started off just applying for small funds and I was quite to do some field work and I was quite successful and then I really started to look into funding things that I wanted to really do and I've been quite lucky with European funding because I'm an open researcher and a lot of open research is funded actually through European grants. They're very, very keen on open research. So um, I've been lucky to lead some projects through this uh, this scheme called EOSC Life, um, which is now transformed into this OSCAR scheme. Um, so I've actually held two EOSC Life um, grants as PI, um, and I've just applied for another one. So fingers crossed I get that, but who knows? Um, and then, so basically what I'm trying to show here is that I've actually gone through a thing where I've applied for lots of small grants and I've been successful in some, not in others, but then it kind of builds up because I think as a researcher, you have to show evidence that you've won grants and you've wrote smaller grants and you've actually been successful. You've produced things from those grants. And the EOSC Life grants have been really good for my personal career because that was my first chance to really lead quite a substantial project. And those projects have, for me, been very successful and have made me as a researcher quite known in that field. Um, we've produced a lot of outputs from those particular projects with that team. And actually everyone in my team has also made quite a lot of progress in their careers because of those particular grants, uh, that particular scheme of grants. Um, and that has kind of led me on to applying for larger grants, which, um, which I haven't talked about. I'll go back to the fellowships in a minute because um, they've been really useful. But these larger grants now, which I'm leading. So um, we had um, EPSSC grant through the health programme, the Skills Policy Award, which was a personal project I did uh, last year. Um, and then we've got this quite large funding now for people in data project. Um, but as you can see, like we've been successful here. So I'm saying we, because these are, apart from actually the Skills Policy Award, these are grants that I've written with other people, their team grants. And although I've been the PI on some of them, I haven't on all of them. I've often been the co-lead on them. Um, so a lot of the things you do in research as you move more senior are team-based rather than being individual-based. Um, as you can see, I've got a lot of unsuccessful ones over here. Uh, some very big ones this three million pound one which was quite disappointing but it is off it is a bit of a numbers game with research and you have to apply for a lot to get get some of them that's kind of how it seems to work in research um so i as you can see i'm waiting for some quite big ones at the moment so keep your fingers crossed for me um and then lastly just these fellowships so fellowships there's the fellowships that emmy was talking about which are um, kind of through funding bodies but actually what I have found really useful in my career are these fellowships with organizations where you become a fellow of a particular organization you still have to apply there's an application process an interview process so this is the Software Sustainability Institute and also Elixir UK which are both kind of open science and data related organization institutes those fellowships so you join a cohort of fellows you do get paid for it it's a small amount of money you often do like community projects those fellowships actually have really developed my career as a researcher in terms of networking in terms of training um, it's been good to have a little bit of extra money but I've actually that has helped me to develop my career and actually that's sort what of produced me to be a bit more promoted and a bit more winning other grants I think because I think it gets your name out there and it's really good for your other grant writing um, and then the last thing to think about which Emmy didn't actually touch on is philanthropic donors so I actually was actually approached by a philanthropic organization last year it's a very different way of doing funding because um, this particular organization which I will not name actually because I'm still going through the process of uh, working with them but they don't have an application process. It's kind of, they approach you, someone suggests that you would be good for their particular organization. They approach you and then you work with them to develop a project and a budget and things like that. So it's quite a different way of actually getting funding for your research compared to grant funding, which we're talking about today. Um, so I'm gonna stop now. 
Um, and I think my last thing to say is do not get disheartened when you get rejection, because <laughs> rejection is part of grant writing, unfortunately, and you do put a lot of effort in, but you do get some back in return. So, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. And um, I'm very happy to take any questions um, in the chat or put your hand up or speak.